A few years ago, I got to see the Broadway show Hamilton, which was easily one of the most impressive performances I have ever seen in person, along with Taylor Swift. Anyway, for three hours, I sat in awe of the creativity and excellence of the entire production. I could talk for a long time about this show, but one of my favorite parts of Hamilton was actually not the show itself, but the drive home from Chicago with my sister. For a full hour, we sat there going back and forth. Wasn't that incredible? Wasn't Eliza's voice amazing? Wasn't King George hilarious? Did you see those acrobats? Did they ever mess up? And as I recounted all of my favorite parts to my sister, what was I doing? I was inviting her to enter into praise with me. I was inviting her to enjoy and marvel at the same object at which I was enjoying and marveling. And why was I doing this? Well, because our joy is amplified when someone else praises the same object that we find beautiful. Our joy is amplified when we share in praising the praiseworthy. And we all know this. When you hear an amazing song or watch an incredible movie or see a beautiful sunset, don't you want to share it with someone? And then after they experience it, you ask them, wasn't that so good? And if they say, that was amazing, joy floods your heart. And that's because it's when we share in praise that our joy is complete. Now, my Hamilton experience is just a small glimpse into what makes Christian discipleship so wonderful. Discipleship is an invitation to worship and enjoy our beautiful and praiseworthy Savior, Jesus Christ, with one another. And when we do that, when we share in praise and pursuit of Jesus, Christ is glorified and our joy is multiplied. So today I'd like to consider three questions. Number one, what is discipleship? Number two, why do discipleship? And number three, how can we grow as disciplers? So number one, what is discipleship? Well, before we define what discipleship is, it's helpful to consider what it is not. Two common misconceptions of discipleship are helpful to identify up front. On the one hand, some people think discipleship is merely community. They think that as long as they have spent time with another Christian, they have therefore done discipleship. On the other hand, some people think discipleship is merely teaching. They think that as long as they gave someone a gospel tract or sent them a sermon, well, then they have therefore done discipleship. Unfortunately, neither community alone nor teaching alone fulfills God's purposes for discipleship. Discipleship, rather, is the marriage between community and teaching. See 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Discipleship is life-on-life, gospel-centered, word-driven, Christ-conforming community. Often, discipleship happens between a mature believer and a younger believer, where the mature believer teaches and walks alongside the younger Christian. But it's not limited to that context. Discipleship happens whenever two people seek to know Christ and love Christ and become more like Christ together. This could be a mother teaching her child how to pray. This could be two young men holding each other accountable. This could be an older Christian mentoring a younger Christian. It could be two friends studying the Bible together or siblings going to church together and then talking about the sermon afterward. It could be a married couple inviting a single adult into the, to their home for dinner and intentional spiritual conversation. So what is discipleship? Well, it's what happens whenever two or more people seek to know Jesus and love Jesus and reflect Jesus and become more like Jesus together. If you want that in three words, biblical discipleship is following Jesus together. So this brings us to the second question, and that is why do discipleship? Why follow Jesus together? Well, there are many reasons for this. Let me just give you two. First, because salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. Jesus is the most precious, most beautiful, most glorious, most trustworthy, most praiseworthy person in the universe, and he is the only unfailing object of salvation and joy and hope and peace. We follow Jesus in order to gain him and to know him. See Philippians 3 verses 8 through 10. So you say, okay, I get that, and I do love Jesus, but why should we follow Jesus together? Can't I just follow him alone? Well, let me tell you about the double blessing that comes from discipleship, a double blessing that comes from following Jesus with someone else. Let's go back to the sunset analogy for a moment. When you enjoy a beautiful sunset with your wife or husband or close friend, two wonderful things happen in that moment. 
First, you end up enjoying the sunset more because of that person's presence, and we've all felt this joy. But that's not all that happens. You also end up enjoying the other person's presence more because of the sunset. The very shared experience itself, the experience of admiring beauty with someone else, it causes you to walk away with a deeper appreciation both for the object of beauty and for the person with whom you are sharing it. Discipleship provides the same double blessing. When you marvel at the beauty of Christ with another person, you walk away with a deeper love both for Christ and for that other person. See Psalm 16, verses 2 through 3. To take that a step further, when you and another person pursue Jesus together, you will not only be able to enjoy the beauty of Christ with that other person, but you will also be able to enjoy the beauty of Christ through that other person. Think about the most patient person you know. Do you realize that this person's patience is helping you understand and cherish the patience of Christ? Think about the most loving person you know. Do you realize that this person's love is helping you understand and cherish the love of Christ? Discipleship is an invitation to enjoy Christ and the people around us more. It's a double blessing. Discipleship is the joy of knowing and being known, of loving and being loved, and becoming more like Christ with someone else. So you say, okay, well, that sounds great on paper, but how? How can I grow as a discipler? Well, that's our third and final question today. So let me briefly give you three marks of an effective discipler. And this is by no means a comprehensive list. It's more of a starting point. Number one, an effective discipler teaches with both her words and her actions. Remember, discipleship is the marriage between teaching and community. Sometimes the most powerful moments of discipleship happen not when you are explaining justification by faith alone at a coffee shop, but when someone simply observes your life. They watch the way you speak gently to your kids, or they hear you repent to your kids after not speaking gently to them, or they see, they see the way you treat the waitress with kindness. They watch you respond with patience when someone cuts you off in traffic. They see how hospitable you are in your home, they hear the way you encourage your classmates or your friends. People will learn just as much about Christ by your actions as they do by your words. So it's important to not only talk about the Christian life with the person you are discipling, but also to live the Christian life with him or her. Number two, an effective discipler regularly spends time with Jesus in God's word and prayer. There is a beautiful phrase in Acts 4.13. I'm excited to share this with you. Listen to this. Acts 4.13, it says that when the Jewish leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Can the people in your life tell that you have been with Jesus? Can they tell that you have been spending time with him? It has been said that you become like the people you are around the most. Can others tell that you have been around Jesus? Do they see Christ shining through you? Do they even hear you talking like him because you have been listening to his words so much? A great way to disciple others is to read the Bible and pray with them. And when these disciplines are already rhythms in your own life, you'll find them naturally spilling out in your interactions with others and your discipleship will be much more fruitful. Third and finally, an effective discipler excels at listening. A common mistake among people in leadership positions is to think that in order to lead a student or a child or a younger Christian, we must major in speaking and telling them what to do and how to live. This is simply not true. While part of discipling others is certainly guiding them through our words, the first step in leading and influencing others is truly knowing them which cannot happen apart from listening. The adage is true. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. We earn the right to speak into the lives of others by first listening well. Is there someone in your life with whom you can have an intentional conversation about Jesus? Sometime today, seek out an opportunity to talk with this person or schedule a time to meet with this person. Often the most meaningful spiritual conversations begin with a very simple question, such as, how are you doing spiritually? How can I pray for you? 
What has God been teaching you recently? What is one way you would like to grow in your faith? What is one joy and one challenge in your faith right now? Can I share a passage with you that has been really encouraging to me recently? Would you like to come to church with me this Sunday? God wants to use you to put the beauty of Christ on display to the people in your life. If you'd like to learn more about discipleship, we've put two book recommendations in the description below. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next video.